Um, are you going to be talking about the faculty staff? I will. Okay. Okay. Um, hello, everyone who's here and joining us online. Um, this is, we have with us Tom Ruggieri. He's been a coordinator at the Faculty Staff Assistant Program for the past 30 years. He's worked with thousands of faculty, staff, and administrators in a variety of personal and professional situations. He's a licensed clinical social worker. He got his um, bachelor's here at College Park and master's in social work from the University of Maryland, Baltimore. And his first job was in Trinidad and Tobago. 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 Oh, no. Okay, sorry. Um, and uh, just a note that this presentation is um, is meant not as a facilitation for specific problems, but uh, more as just a presentation on some ideas and thoughts that you might have. And then if you have questions in the mind, in, in sort of in the mindset of this being a presentation, not like specific problems with people, etc. Um, that is what he is here for, but if you do want to get in touch with the faculty staff assistant program to talk about those things that may be not appropriate for this session, I'm sure Tom will tell us a lot more about that. Thank you. Great introduction. Thanks. So, I, yeah, thank you for the facilitation piece. So, I will welcome any questions as long as it doesn't start with, so I have a situation <laughs> here at work, because that will take up the whole time. Okay? Sound fair? All right. Um, Thanks for asking me to be here. I, um, Kathy just reminded me I did a similar presentation two years ago. I, did, I remember doing it, but I didn't remember the topic. So was anyone there for that? Okay. All right. Well, I'm sure you forgot everything. And if you didn't, I did. So it'll be a refresher. Um, I used to call this um, dealing with difficult people. And that content is included in here, but I've changed the title to Conflicts at Work because I found that a lot of people with that title were coming in thinking that they would magically get some skills in dealing with the other person as if they weren't a part of the problem. So I think overall what I'm hoping to impart to you is some notion of how you might be able to better deal with conflicts because you're really the only person in the equation that you have control over. Okay, so I base this presentation on um, a lot of information I've obtained from meeting literally with over 5,000 employees over the past 30 years, and the biggest problem area that people come to see us for is some kind of workplace issue, uh, some, and it usually involves an interpersonal conflict. So I've read a lot, but I've learned a lot more from sort of what works and what doesn't work, and <clears throat> the one thing I know is that it's a skill. And we don't all have the skill. And so I hope that you'll leave here today feeling just a little bit more comfortable with approaching somebody if you feel like there's a conflict that needs to be addressed. And I'll give you all kinds of ideas of how to do that and when might be a time that it makes sense to do it as opposed to ignoring it and all those kinds of things. My challenge is it's a two-hour presentation and I have an hour, so I'm going to talk fast and I won't get to every slide, but I'll get to most of the important slides. Um, any questions about that? All right, let me start with a question to you all. So on a spectrum of comfort level with conflict, okay, I'd like you to place yourself one to ten. One to three is no way, no how, I would rather quit. Okay, thinking about having to have a conversation with somebody you're in a conflict with, okay? Four to seven. Well, I will do it, but I'll, I, if I have to, but it's not going to be fun and it's not going to be easy. Okay? 8 to 10, it's not my favorite thing to do, but I'm actually pretty good at having difficult conversations with people. All right, 1 to 3. Really? All right. 4 to 7? Yeah, everybody always <laughs> likes the top of that bell curve. 8 to 10? Okay, all right, so you're all normal. Um, <laughs> how boring. Um, what most groups will, s most groups kind of congregate toward the one to three. I mean, most, most people are kind of uncomfortable with having any kind of conflict. However, some people really don't mind. Now, I have to say, I grew up in a household of nine Italians and two bathrooms, okay? <laughs> so I really learned conflict. Uh, and how to manage it at an early age. I learned what didn't work and what did work and you know just 
from a lifetime of that. You learn patience, cooperation, you, you learn a lot of things. So for me, it's, I mean, I'm not crazy about having to have a difficult conversation with somebody, but I, I don't shy away from it that much anymore because it's a skill I've learned, and like any skill, the more you do it, the more comfortable you are. So that's kind of where I want to head with this. Okay, so let's jump in. So I was asked to talk a little bit about our program and, and what we do, and so Joan and I are the two people who are in the program. Between us, we've been on campus 48 years. So what we do, we're the Campus Employee Assistance Program. So what that means is we can provide up to 10 free and confidential visits for assessment, referral, counseling. Um, we also, since our biggest problem area is workplace issues, I think the better term to describe what we do with that is coaching and consultation. I don't really care what happened to you at two years old between you and your mom, it's between you guys, but you know, unless it has an impact on how you're dealing with your boss, how you're dealing with your colleagues and coworkers. Um, occasionally we will do mediation, we, we offer that, but I will tell you in most cases around a difficult conversation that someone has to have, I usually coach the person in how to have that conversation and the need for mediation is usually not that strong because what most people do in a conflict is what? Guesses? Okay. Avoid it. <laughs> Avoid it. So really my job is to say no, you really can have this conversation, you should have this conversation. Let's practice it. By the time they do all that, they're, they're kind of ready to go. Okay. So we, do, we have done mediation, but um, I try to shy away from it. In 1993, we started an emergency loan fund, which means we can pay bills for employees up to $1,500. There's no interest. They have six months to pay it back. The only thing you have to have is a legitimate bill. Creditor has to have a federal tax ID number, and you have to have a checking account that your paycheck goes into through direct deposit. Okay, it's been a huge help for employees. We've given nine hundred thousand dollars in loans to, uh, since 1993. It's a way to keep people at work. If somebody can't pay their rent and they're going to be evicted, they're out of work for a week or two. So it's it's really. I mean, it sounds like well, you guys are really nice, but we're just practical. We're just trying to find a way to keep people at work. We pay them. We want to be at work. Um, we also do presentations. I do this one. I've done stress management. The, um, I've trained the entire facilities staff, which took me almost two years, in substance abuse and substance abuse policies and how we address substance abuse. It's not our, our biggest problem area, but it's our most expensive problem area. And the one that's probably in some ways the most easily addressed. And our philosophy is, you know, we want these people back at work too because they've been here an average of 15 years. And at one point, they were really good, valuable employees, and we know we can get them back <coughs> to being a valuable employee. And it's less expensive to do that than it is to terminate them and rehire and recruit somebody else and regain 15 years of experience. So again, being very practical. <coughs> the most recent presentation that I've done, two or three of, and I, I like it, and I'm happy to come back and do it for you all, is um, est uh, establishing boundaries and learning how to say no. Okay, because that's another, and these ideas just come out of situations that people present when they come in, and you know, the more I see kind of trends of things, I go, mm, I need to give a presentation on that, because I've learned a lot from talking to the people. And then finally, the last thing we do is when a traumatic event happens on campus, usually a death, um, we're usually the ones who are called to come in and do a debriefing. We do it with the police a lot. They deal with traumatic events more than anyone else. They're kind of interesting because since they deal with traumatic events more than anyone else, they don't feel like they really need to have a debriefing, but every time we do it, a very interesting conversation always comes up. So like the last one we did, there was a suicide on campus, which I'm sure you all know about, the first day of class, and you know, the two people who had to inform the mother of the student, can you imagine a more difficult job than that? It's pretty tough. I don't care how long you've been a veteran of the police force, you're gonna to wanna to talk about that. You know, and so they did, and it was a very interesting conversation, and I think useful for people. So that's one of the last things we do. So kind of in a nutshell, that's the FSAP. Uh, beyond that, this campus, I think, is designed to deal with conflict in ways beyond what a lot of other campuses do. And I know this because I presented what we do as a group. Is we have this informal conflict resolvers network, so we have four ombuds people on campus, one for each group, faculty, one for staff, one for undergraduate students, and one for graduate students. And they kind of pave the way for people who have some kind of an administrative issue that they can't figure out what, whether it's a unfair pay or can't get their grade or you know whatever it happens to be. And, and these are folks who 
hopefully sort of know their way, they know who the people are that can get things done. So they, that's one way of dealing with conflict. We're also on the group staff relations over in the Chesapeake building is on the group staff relations. Their primary job is to assist managers in development and if um, somebody needs discipline or termination, they sort of walk them through how to do that. Um, we also have um, Title IX office and uh, the Center for Leadership and Organizational Change are all part of that group. We meet once a month just to kind of keep our fingers on the pulse of what's going on kind of globally on campus. If any trends are happening, any departments in particular that seem to be having problems, if there's something we can do as a group or any of our departments can do individually, um, we, we try to support each other in doing that. And what we like to say is, you know, you can call anybody in this network, and if it's the wrong department, anybody will sort of point you in the right direction. So I think part of the assumption here is that the university just recognizes that, yeah, we've got uh, 10,000 staff, and what are we up to, 36,000 students now? I think it used to always be 34, or I think it's 36 now, and we have no place to put them, and um, that causes conflict. So just recognizing it and, and knowing that we have it and providing resources to deal with it is, I think, a, a benefit for us. Workplace conflict and stress. It increases the number one problem seen in employee assistance programs. It used to be substance abuse when I first got here. It was not just here, but nationally, but that dropped in the early 1990s, and I think the reason for that is because that was when drug testing started in, in industry and a lot of businesses and companies and universities were developing drug-free workplace policies. We do have one here. We get it once a year from the president. Nobody ever reads it, except when they have to. Um, and um, so I think all those things had an impact. I mean, it doesn't mean that we don't have an alcohol and drug problem. Obviously, our opiate problem has skyrocketed. Um, you don't tend to see that as much in the workplace of, except for family members. I mean, somebody who has an opiate addiction is probably not going to be in the workplace for very long. I mean, that's how severe of a problem it is. But I've seen plenty of family members who are dealing with somebody who has that problem. But um, it's dropped, and, and um, workplace stress really has kind of become the number one issue for most employee assistance programs. It accounts for 74 to 90 percent of all visits to the doctor. It's a leading source of stress for adults, more so than health complaints, financial, or family problems and it causes about one million Americans to miss work every day. So, you know, it's a costly issue that's important for us to deal with. So I want to kind of break down, you know, when we have these conflicts at work into us and them. You know, usually what happens is somebody comes to see me and they will explain this difficult person that they're working with and they might go into great detail. And I divide people into kind of like two categories in, in this sense. It's either somebody who, when they're telling me about this problem, also includes their role, like this is what I said, and, and I don't think that went over very well, and I retreated and I tried this approach. It's like they're telling me that they have some insight about they have a role in this conflict. And then there's the other kind of person who spends 45 minutes telling me everything about this problem person, but nothing about that. So I might ask, so what's your role in this? And they go, oh, Mr. Gary, you're obviously not listening to me. I am not the problem here. The other person is the problem. I have a real hard time with that person because they're going to have a hard time recognizing their role. Okay, so a lot of this comes down to us and them. So let's start with them. Okay, these difficult people that are in the workplace. Who are they? So tomorrow's National Slap Your Annoying Coworker Day. If you're not sure who that is, you might want to call in sick. Sometimes these situations do make us feel like resorting to violence, just make sure you've examined your role before you start pointing fingers at others. So who are the others? Who are these difficult people? I know it's nobody in this room or out there in the ethernet. Uh, so people who dominate conversations and never give anyone else a chance to talk. People who constantly berate themselves. Skeptics who don't seem to believe a word you say. People who can't make a decision. Gossips who seem more interested in everyone else's business rather than their own. Manipulators who are expert at getting you to do what they want. That's a terrible phrase. I need to change it. People who are undependable. Dependent people who are unable to do anything for themselves. Angry people who seem ready to explode at any minute. People who feel terribly uncomfortable around others. And a few more. People who are not always truthful. Flatterers who lavish you with praise. 
but don't really seem to care about you, and people who are experts on everything. What am I leaving out? It's a pretty big list. But what are some of the difficult people you've encountered without naming names? Situations that I've left out. People who don't just listen to you when you say no, you can't do that. People who don't listen to you when you say no, mm -hmm. and they just continue to do it. Yeah. Okay. Or just expect you to fulfill their needs or wants okay. without you being able to do it. Actually. So you should come to the presentation I have on saying no. Oh, I, I do say no. <laughs> okay. I just, and they, and they just roll right past you. I say no, and they don't listen, and right. I say no again. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes you have to do it three times. Yeah. Any other situations? You're about to speak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be <laughs> no, I guess related to um, people who uh, don't don't take no for an answer. People who uh, you know don't take don't think of your time as important. Think of their own right. They put okay. themselves on their own schedule. Right. And yes. It's more about them than it is about other members of the team. Um, people who maybe can get on power trips about things and and that are more hurtful to the work being done than helpful okay. in that way. So a little condescension maybe yeah. going on, I'm higher than you are. Okay. One of the things that may or may not be in here but has become patently obvious to me is that how many of your supervisors? Okay. The way to get things done any place but certainly in the workplace is through establishing relationships. And I think when people rely on power, their position, their title, if I ever hear, do you know who I am, I'm like, they lost me. They lost me right there. So it's really very important to put time into developing and establishing relationships. I'm more impressed with somebody by their first name than what they do, because I know that person can get things done for me. Okay? So what are some characteristics of difficult behavior? It includes verbal and nonverbal modes of expression as well as sometimes physical, hopefully not. Ongoing, not just a single event. So we're talking about a pattern, not just a one-time thing that somebody did that was irritating. It's unwelcome, it's unwanted. It involves a violation of a standard of conduct towards or treatment of others or the rights of others. And it results in some kind of harm, either emotional or physical. It's intended, not a loss of control, but even if it is a loss of control, it's still problematic. Oftentimes it involves power differences. Some of difficult behaviors at work, abusive or demeaning language, blaming or shaming others for mistakes, errors, or problems, intimidation, verbal or physical, lack of regard for the comfort and dignity of others, racial, ethnic, or socioeconomic slurs or insults, sarcasm, although I'm pretty good at number six myself, Seductive, aggressive, or assaultive behavior, sexual comments or innuendos, sexual harassment or assault, threats of violence, retribution, or litigation, uncooperative, defiant approach to problems, unprofessional demeanor or conduct, just as a few examples. Two of the greatest qualities to have in life are patience and wisdom. We don't always have the luxury to react based on how we feel, especially at work. So be sure to take a breath. Examine your many options, check it out with others, and then proceed. Where I see a lot of people getting into trouble is reacting emotionally. Somebody said something, did something, you have a gut reaction, and then your behavior reflects that gut reaction, and next thing you know, you're in my office, and you're like, uh-oh, I probably said or did something I shouldn't have said. How do I backtrack? Okay? So just take a breath, think about it. Why are people difficult? Again, we're thinking about the other person, not you. So here's some interesting questions to ask. This came from a wonderful book called Thank You for Being Such a Pain. A title like that, you gotta read it, right? <laughs> How much do you really know about this person and their background? How accurate do you think your perception of the situation is? That's one of the hardest questions because we all have egos and we're all right. We always think we're correct. And our perspective on the situation is one of many, but we tend to gravitate toward ours because it's ours. Have you described the situation to an objective person? Might they see it differently? Have you considered alternative explanations for their behavior and have your emotions changed as a result? 
Have you given the person the benefit of the doubt, or are you assuming negative intent and malice? So if you go into a situation with assumptions about the other person's behavior, it will be reflected in your tone and your attitude. Although it's hard, try and keep an open mind and allow for many plausible explanations that reflect positively on the person. Even if you don't think there's anything positive about them, force yourself to allow for the possibility there might be a, po a positive explanation or another explanation other than your own because even though you're saying the right words, if you're thinking otherwise, it will come across. If they know that your expectations of them are positive, they'll often act that way. If they know that you're, gosh, how do I do this? Okay, here we go. I haven't done this before. I've got more notes than I have room for. If they know that your expectations of them are positive, they'll often act that way. If they know that you're assuming the worst, they will also act accordingly. All right, that's the other person. Now let's talk about us. And from here on out, I'm going to talk about us because, as I said, we're the ones that we have control over. So what's our role in handling a conflict? Mark Rosen, the same author from um, the, uh, the book, says, Life is a school and difficult people are the faculty. Difficult people can either be our cross to bear or our opportunity for learning and growth. How we think about it will determine our actions. Now this is interesting because when people come in and they say, you know, oh gosh, I have to, why do I have to deal with this person? You know, if that's the philosophy about it, it's it's really going to be miserable for them. So I try to flip it a little bit. And one of the ways I do that is to ask people, and this is always fascinating to me, have you ever run into this specific situation before? And I'm amazed at how many times they say, you know, I have. Well, tell me about that. Well, I had a previous boss or three bosses back, or, you know, my older sister is exactly like this, and my dad, don't even get me started, okay? So what I've learned from that is there's this thing in psychology called repetition compulsion. And I think Carl Jung came up with this. And basically, the theory is we unconsciously put ourselves in situations, oftentimes that we're familiar with. We may not like them, but we're familiar with them. We kind of know how to navigate in those situations. Not well, but we kind of know our role. We sort of know how to act in those situations. And there's an attempt to get it right. Each time you find yourself in a newer situation, you're hoping to get it right. But because it's unconscious, you're not really thinking about your role, you tend to not get it right. Because you tend to act the same way over and over again. So part of how I try to get people to think about this current conflict is, oh my God, it's not this burden that's the end of the world, but hey, here's an opportunity for you to figure out how to deal with this person. Because you know what? According to your history, this isn't the first time it's probably not going to be the last time. So if you think about it as, hey, you know, if I can figure out how to work with this person, that's like another thing in my toolbox, you know, that I can go into another situation and maybe I can use those same skills. So that's the first thing I'm trying to do is to get them to see it as not such a, a burden, but, you know, maybe I can actually learn something about this. I'm, as you can see, I'm sort of manipulating them in the most positive way possible to want to do this as opposed to, you know, why am I stuck with this? Now, there are four ways that we typically react to difficult people. And I'll tell you a quick story. When I read this book, as I was involved and embroiled in a difficult situation with a boss, it kind of hit me in the head like a hammer because I was doing all four of these things. So I had a situation with a director a few directors ago, and I've been here 10, 15 years. And this particular director had been here as long as I'd been here. And um, I kind of knew a lot of their warts, okay, because I'd done a lot of mediation with this director and other physicians that this person worked with, okay. So I think that kind of got us off on the wrong foot. And as she was appointed director, she called me in and she said, you know, I just want to tell you, you have a terrible reputation on campus. That's all I have to say. I'm like, okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, you know, I'm trying to rebound from that. And I said, well, you know, I mean, that's okay because sometimes I have to deal with really difficult situations and people who are sometimes about to be fired or sent over to see me. And sometimes they lose their job. And yes, I can see that there might be some people that don't have a high opinion of me. Um, 
can you give me some feedback and help me out with that? No, I really can't. He said, okay, I'm in trouble. This person does not like me, and this is not going to go well. So rather than being scared, which probably would have been a smart way to react, I got angry, which was not a smart way to react, okay? So every time I got an email from this person, I read it, the worst possible tone, intent that I possibly could have read it, okay? Then I started reading this book, and one of the things they suggested was, A, do not respond right away, because of course I was, you know? I mean, the, the tone was angry, I shot back an angry email. You know, finally, my wife one night said, you do realize this is your boss, right? Got it. So I started showing these emails to other people, and I was a little stunned when, even though I tried to convince them, I tried to bias them ahead of time. Don't you think she's saying this in this email? And they would read it and go, maybe, but she could also be saying this, this, and this. And I was like, whoa, how do you read that? There's no way I'm reading that. But it forced me to allow for another possible perspective that wasn't my own. Man, I got to tell you, that was hard. That's always the hardest part, okay? So let me go through these. So I learned a lot from that. And by the way, we ended up being really good colleagues and even kind of friendly. And part of the reason for that was nothing she did. It all came from me. I had to adjust my attitude. I had to allow for the possibility that she might have been saying something that I didn't think she was saying, I had to stop being disrespectful and start being respectful. And once that started happening, her attitude toward me changed. So what I learned from that was, yeah, I, I mean, I had a lot, I think from my explanation, you would agree, I had a lot of reasons to be scared, angry, and think this wasn't going to work out too well. But if I was waiting for her to be the one to turn that around, I would have been waiting a long time. In fact, I might not have been working here. <laughs> so it had to come from me. So here are the four ways that we typically react to difficult people. And I would encourage you to think about a situation you might be in, particularly at work, and see if any of these apply. So number one, we tend to misunderstand difficult people by focusing solely on what they do, not what we do in response to their words and actions. Number two, we often amplify the influences of difficult people by stripping away their positive attributes and overemphasizing their negative characteristics. Okay, so it's becomes an all or nothing situation. People are more complicated than that, right? I mean, nobody's all bad, nobody's all good, you know? But in this number two, what you're doing is just pointing out all the bad parts of that person. But that's not enough, because now we gotta include friends. So we build a coalition against difficult people by telling others about their words and actions. In the process, we ensure a no-win situation in which the difficult person cannot make a turnaround and we cannot back down from our position as critics. You know what I call that? Lunch. Okay, that's usually what happens at lunch, right? People get together and, oh, God, do you believe she did this now? And, oh, you know, everybody's kicking something in. Now, how many times in that lunch have you heard somebody say, well, but hold on a second. On the other hand, she's done this. He's done that. Everybody's going to kind of look at you like, do you not know the rules of this game? Like, this is not how this works. We're trashing the person. <laughs> Number four, we ascribe motives to the difficult person that makes him or her seem narrow, self-serving, vengeful, or stupid. These motives usually support our view, but usually have little to do in reality with explaining the other person's words and actions. Okay? So I see everybody looking around like, okay, we know somebody here. Who, okay, we all do. We all have those people in our lives. So I don't know. When I read that, I just thought, you know what? That was so helpful for me to, I mean, immediately, I just saw situations where I did that and how hard it was for me to look at my own piece. And it literally, I mean, it shifted the way I was dealing with this boss, and it helped me tremendously. So I, I hope just those four things right there, I hope you maybe see yourself in that and go, wow, how can I do it differently? Okay, so let's talk about ways that you might be able to do it differently. So I've always used this slide from as far back as I can remember, as sort of a simple way to think about when you have a stressor in your life, what are your options? How can you deal with that stressor? So this is called the triple ABC method of managing stress. So basically, you can alter, you can avoid, or you can accept the situation, okay? So alter implies 
some kind of behavior, some kind of action that you're taking, all right? So you're having this conflict with this person. I'm either going to talk with them, or I'm going to quit, or I'm going to get transferred, or I'm going to do something so that I don't have to continue to deal with this situation all the time, okay? You're altering your situation. You can avoid the situation. I, in most cases, I would say avoid. There's a reason it comes second. Okay, because it's usually after you've said no three times and they're still, you know, not paying attention. So, you know, you can lock your door. Don't, don't give me the opportunity to ask you. Don't answer the email. Don't answer the phone call. Um, avoiding is usually an okay option after you've tried to alter the situation. And, and literally after you've really tried, not just once, but, you know, a couple of times. And, and I'll go over some very specific ways about how to do that. Now, some situations, you know, it's really tough for us to alter or avoid. I mean, if you have a physical medical diagnosis of something, um, I mean, of course you're going to alter it to the extent that you can. You can go to the doctor, you can take medicine, you can take care of yourself, physical therapy, do whatever you can do. Avoiding it's probably not a great idea. I mean, I'm sure we've all had people in our lives where they say, you know, they have some symptoms. You go, well, when's the last time you, you went to the doctor? They go, oh, I don't go to the doctor. Well, why? Well, I'm afraid what they're going to tell me. Like, what? Okay, that's an example of a void that I just don't get, okay? But we all have people in, those, in our lives who that's kind of how they manage their stress, okay? But for most people, you know, a medical diagnosis, I mean, you're sort of stuck with accepting the situation. And what are ways that you do that? Well, two ways. One is you build your resistance, and basically what that implies is all the things that you need to do to take better care of yourself physically, psychologically, socially, to manage stress. So you eat well, you exercise, you get enough sleep, you know. Those lifestyle changes tend to be the most important things that I recommend to people first to help manage stress, anxiety, and depression. I mean, way before I get them on medication or anything else. Because lots of times, you know, these problems, not always, but lots of times, they're self-imposed, you know, I mean, just people's lives are kind of out of control. And they feel trapped, and they feel like there's nothing I can do. And boy, if there's any recipe for depression, it's a feeling of being trapped, and there's nothing I can do. So part of what you're trying to do is get them to realize, no, there is, okay? But so part, part of the way is building resistance, taking care of yourself. And a really important part is the C part, which is changing your perception. How you think about the situation has a tremendous impact on whether or not you're going to do anything about it. So that's just a, kind of a quick little, like, how to think about stressors. What are my approaches here, okay? Just trying to get you out of the realm of there's nothing I can do because the victim story is the worst story in the world, okay? Now, what I do in terms of counseling and what most people I know uh, do in terms of counseling is this cognitive behavioral therapy approach, okay? But CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is studied annually by the military because they spend billions of dollars on treating veterans and they want to make sure what works okay CBT consistently comes out as being the number one evidence-based treatment modality that counselors psychologists psychiatrists psychologists use in, in trying to help people so I'm just going to pass on some basic concepts of CBT so you have it because it really applies to dealing with difficult people and, you know, probably the most difficult person that any of us are ever going to have to deal with is us, okay? We kind of stand, we, we are the biggest barrier in most cases. So you can get a handle on your own thoughts, how that works, you're going to be halfway there. So basically what we do is we see or hear something that happens. We tell ourselves a story. We have an emotional reaction to that story, and then we act in a particular way. Another way of saying that is A plus B leads to C. So A are the activating events in our life, the things that are happening, the stressors. Those plus our B, our beliefs, our thoughts about those stressors, are what leads to an emotional consequence. Most people leave out the B. What they think is, oh, this really bad thing happened, and I'm depressed. I'm depressed because this really bad thing happened. Well, you're depressed because this really bad thing happened and how you think about the really bad thing that happened. So I'll tell you where this came from. Viktor Frankl wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. Who's read it? So it's, it's a fantastic book. And one of the things he talks about was that he was in a concentration camp when he was younger. And he knew 
that the only way he was going to survive that camp if he wasn't gassed. I mean, if, first of all, he was praying that somebody would come and rescue him, and somebody did. But he also knew that psychologically, the only way he was going to survive being in that concentration camp was to do everything he could to focus on anything positive that he could possibly think about. Now, you're probably thinking, what the hell is positive in a concentration camp? Not a whole lot, okay? But if this guy can think of something positive in a concentration camp, I think we can probably, <laughs> in our own lives, come up with a more positive way of thinking about things. So he would, he would look at some of the people who were there and, you know, an adult might be given a little tiny, you know, piece of bread and, and he would give it to a kid, you know, and he'd be like, wow, that's incredible. You know, in the midst of this horrible act on humanity, here's somebody acting in a humane kind of way. And he just would focus on that. You know, he could also focus on the fact that, oh my God, I'm probably going to die. This is the worst thing that could ever happen. Both of those thoughts would have been correct. But we have a choice. And he chose to think about those things. Fortunately, he was rescued. They were all rescued. He lived to tell the tale, wrote many books. It's an excellent book. So it's kind of where the concept comes from, OK? Um, so this is just another sort of model of it. So another way of the A, B, and C, adversity, or activating events, any problem situation, big or small, uh, plus how we think about that. So it's the belief about what cause is about the implications, leads to the consequences, the emotional and behavioral consequences. So another graphic way of displaying this is this. So, what the hell is that? Oh, just my mind, OK? So we all walk around all day long with you know, our tapes rolling in our head, you know? And we're either very good at recognizing those tapes and challenging some of those, what we call ants, automatic negative thoughts, okay? Or well, they just roll, and we pay no attention to them, and we have an emotional reaction, and we have no idea why. So when people come to see us, one of the first things we do is kind of give them this list of automatic negative thoughts that we all utilize, and I'll, and I'll show you that in a second. And I have them come back a week later and say, you know, pick out the ones that you do routinely. And most people come and say, well, I do all of them, but, you know, my top three are these three right here. Okay. And so then I want to teach them the three C's. I want them to catch it, I want them to check it, and I want them to change it. So I want them to catch the thoughts that they're having. I want them to check to see which one of the automatic negative thoughts they are. And then I want them to ask themselves a very important question, which is, is this thought helpful for me? Because sometimes a negative thought is helpful. And I was working with an ex-football player one time, and he said, you know, if I missed a tackle, I kind of berate myself and say, you know, don't miss that next tackle. You're going to get in there. And, get... and that will kind of motivate me to do it. Like, All right. That's a negative thought that worked for you, OK? But 95% of the time, the negative thoughts we have are not helpful, OK? But it's important to ask that question. Is this a helpful thought? And if it's not a helpful thought, then logically, what might be a more helpful way for me to think about this situation? That's CBT in a nutshell, OK? So just a couple of things that will kind of help with that. So you have this belief in thought, and there's different kinds, like loss, danger, trespass, and then some potential emotional consequences as a result of that, and then behavioral consequences as a result of that. So you've got the, the action, what happened, your belief about it, how you react emotionally, and then behaviorally, how you act. By the way, if anybody wants a copy of all this stuff, just send me an email and I'll send it to you, okay? So it's all, it's all in there. There's another little thing I use with people to kind of help them break down some of these thoughts that they're having. So what was the activating event? They write down what the belief and thought was, what they did as a result, and then ask that question. Is this a helpful way for me to think about this? And then the checking is write down what some of those thinking traps or cognitive distortions are. So here they are, all or nothing thinking, where everything's good or bad. All or nothing thinking is what most of us use. It's a survival technique, okay? Sometimes when we're walking around down a dark alley and there's three 18-year-olds across the street and they look a little dangerous, we have to make a quick decision, safe or unsafe, okay? We don't have time for, you know, well, if I just knew a little bit more about their background and where they come from, and we don't have time for that, right? This is like, Am I going to be alive or not alive? I have to make a quick decision, okay? So there's some things in our lives that are like that, but most things aren't, and yet we still go 
to all or nothing thinking. You know, we're like people are good or bad. You know, the movie we saw. You know, you walk out and you're like, man, that sucked. Then you go have dinner with five people and you're all talking about the movie and somebody says, yeah, you know, the acting, that one actor was pretty good. And you're like, yeah, actually he was, you know. And actually the cinematography was beautiful. That, that is true, the cinematography was, and the score, oh my God, the music was great. Well, you know, that's true. So now all of a sudden you've gone from the movie sucked to, well, there's parts of the movie that was pretty good. Now you're, you've gone from black and white to gray, okay? And most things in life are gray. Most things are not absolutely this or absolutely that, but we tend to think that way. Magnification. We blow things out of proportion. The tiniest little thing happens, and oh my God, it's the end of the world. Minimization is just the opposite. Something really good happens, and we don't congratulate ourselves for it. Oh, that, it was nothing, okay? Um, I mean, I always say that real self-esteem comes from accomplishment. You set goals, you say you want to do something, you do it, and probably the part that people leave out of that is at the end of doing it, wow, that was really good that you did that. That's really important because that's how you feel good about yourself. Not looking in the mirror going, hey, you're a swell guy. I mean, that's, you know, that's BS. I mean, accomplishment. And so you don't want to minimize the things that you've done. And I have people sometimes just, you know, the smaller accomplishment, the better, you know. Hey, you woke up today, great, you know. You took a shower, fantastic, you know. I mean, it beats the alternative negative thought of, oh, that was nothing, and my life stinks, and, you know, who cares, anybody can take a shower. But sometimes you got to start with the basics. Mind reading, you're sure what the other person's thinking by the way they rolled their eyes or whatever they did. Fortune telling, being able to predict what's going to happen. Self-fulfilling prophecy, right? I know this bad thing's going to happen. More than likely it is because you're, you're setting things in motion to have that happen. I like to joke that um, I get more exercise from jumping to conclusions than anything else, okay? So we got to be careful of that one. Personalizing, catastrophizing, we all do these, okay? I have a, another slide that is a little bit more graphic and kind of breaks them down and has a little image for each one that might make it a little bit easier. Again, what I have people do is they just carry this around in their pocket. And when they catch it and check it and realize that, well, I have this thought rolling in my head right now, you know, what kind of automatic negative thought is it? Then they start to, after time, they kind of start laughing at how predictable our brains are. I mean, these are nothing but bad habits. Now, a lot of people will be like, well, why? Why do I think like this? And I was going, you know, I don't care. I don't care why you think like that. It, because it's the false assumption that if I just know why I do this, I won't do it anymore. That's like saying if you know why you smoke cigarettes, you'll be able to stop it. You know, it's a bad habit. Smoking cigarettes is a bad habit. You gotta do a lot of things to stop smoking cigarettes on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. Same with our automatic negative thoughts. The where they came, I mean, tell you where they came from. It's how you were raised, it's your environment, your parents, it's all the messages we got from all the people in our lives. Okay, do you feel better? I mean, now you know where they came from, but that doesn't mean you're going to stop doing them. You're never going to stop your automatic thoughts. You're really just trying to manage them. So it's like you're driving the bus, and you've got all these passengers that are your automatic negative thoughts, okay? And every once in a while, one of them like talks a little bit louder than the other, and you're like, yeah, back off, will you? You don't want any of them ever driving the bus, okay? You're the one driving the bus. But those passengers are always going to be in your head, okay? So we all like to tell a story. Our stories are either completely accurate and propel this these are our beliefs, right? When something happens. So our stories are either completely accurate and propel us into a healthy direction, or they're quite inaccurate but justify our current behavior, making us feel good about ourselves and calling for no need to change. So when you see the three clever stories that we all like to tell ourselves, they all have one thing in common, and that is we don't have to take responsibility for this problem, therefore it's okay for us to do nothing. Avoid. Okay, so the three clever stories are, it's not my fault, it's all your fault, or there's nothing else I can do. Okay, and I can pretty much size up that person pretty quickly when they come in, so it's like, you know, I mean, if you're really just coming in to complain, that's okay. I mean, if that makes you feel better, that's great, but I'm not gonna go out and grab the person and change them. I mean, if you wanna do something, to change the situation. And sometimes it, it, really the best option is to avoid. So I'm not saying you have to do something in every case, but simply coming in and talking about it is, is taking some action. It's like, you know, I'm trying to figure out what's the best way to address this, okay? 
So I'm realizing I'm running out of time, so I'm going to kind of skip ahead, try and get to a few things. All right, so some solutions that won't work. Repeatedly urging the difficult person to change, trying to talk the difficult person into liking your request to change, demanding acknowledgement that you're right about his or her need to change, using the indirect approach, that hinting in various ways that he or she needs to change, or trying to conquer your fear of confronting the person with endless preparation. So, okay, how do we have this difficult conversation with people? A couple of steps. Number one, and I'll go over each of these. Stay centered, be assertive, use confrontation if necessary, respond to the underlying message, and if need be, after all of those things have been tried, sometimes your only option is to terminate the relationship. So let's start with staying centered. Try not to use violence or engage in self-destructive behavior. Understand that it's the other person who has the problem while also acknowledging your role in the conflict. Don't allow yourself the luxury of reacting emotionally. Deep breathing is really important. It helps you to stay relaxed. Deep breathing is simply breathing in through your nose, exhaling through your mouth, and at the bottom of the exhale, count to three or four. So it's like... Now, I use this all the time. It's magic. It's free. There's no side effects. Nobody knows you're doing it. I do it in a meeting like this. I don't use the sound effects. Nobody knows I'm doing it. But when in my office, I'm, you know, I mean, it's just, I do it three or four times. Actually, I read somewhere that if you do it six times, and I don't know what it is about six, but if you do it six times, which probably takes you a whole minute or two, it does a number of things. It, Let's the adrenaline, which is what kicks in when you're stressed out, gives it some place to go, right? It's kind of like having your brain be a thermostat, where you walk into a room and the heat's on and you flip it and the air conditioning comes on. So if your brain is sensing stress or anxiety, it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's pumping adrenaline, cortisol, norepinephrine into your body so that you can fight or flight, okay? Once you start to breathe in a deep breathing kind of way, it's sending a signal to the brain that this body is not reacting the way I think it should be reacting. I think this body's trying to relax. So the brain begins to shut down the stress hormones and starts to produce relaxation hormones. That's why when you leave here and you go sit down and you do six of these deep breathing things, you're gonna feel a little funny. It's not just a psychological change, it's a physiological change. Deep breathing really works. So anytime you find yourself in a, not just a conflict situation, because really, it really helps there, but just if you do it eight to ten times a day, like every hour or so, do it when you wake up, do it before you go to bed at night, very relaxing. It also trains you to notice when you're reacting to stress more quickly. Because you're training your body to be relaxed eight to ten times a day, so what that does is as you're starting to become more stressed, you're like, oh, wait a minute, I just noticed that I'm starting to, what, what just happened there? And I'm like having a stress reaction. It's helpful in that sense. The, the way I know it works, like when I get a big stressor, like somebody cuts me off and I hit the brakes and grab my steering wheel. In the old days, I used to give the international sign for I love you, but I can't do that anymore. So, you know, you just kind of have a stress reaction, right? And you can feel it go from zero to ten really quickly. And because I'm in the practice of doing this deep breathing all the time, I don't even think about it. I just start deep breathing. And I can feel that 10 go like really quickly. And every time I do it, I just go, wow, this stuff really does work. Because when I'm doing it every day, it's like, yeah, okay, I got, I got a little, little comfort, a little you know, meditation, and it felt pretty good. But when the stress is high and I do it and it comes down so quickly, that's how I know it really works. So that is a way to stay centered prior to meeting with the person. You also want to unbundle the problems. It's just a way to think about the problem. Is it a CPR? Is it a content problem, pattern, or relationship? Content is like a single instance. Do I really need to talk to the person about a single instance? P, it's a pattern. This has happened a lot. And I have a lot of examples of how I can present this to the person. And then the, the, the third kind of conflict might be a relationship issue, how the problem is affecting your working relationships. Okay, let me talk about steps to being assertive. Because people will always say, well, you just need to assert yourself, but nobody really kind of describes what's involved in that process. So number one, this says evaluate your rights. And this is from a book called um, 
uh, what is the title of this book? Edmund Bourne is the author, and it's uh, anxi and anxiety and something like dealing with anxiety and phobia, something like that. If you look up Edmund Bourne, it'll come up. And he has this page of sort of personal bill of rights that we all have, like I have the right to change my mind and well, things like that. And basically, I, I did not bring it with me, but I usually hand it out as kind of a reminder to yourself of why you need to be assertive with this person, okay? Uh, number two, designate a time. Now, all of these steps involve respect for the other person and a desire to work out a conflict, okay? This, asserting yourself does not mean you're just gonna go and blow the person out of the water, okay? I mean, if that makes you feel better, great, but it's probably not gonna do a whole lot for your working relationship. So designating a time is a way of respectfully saying to that person, you know, I know you have a schedule, and I do too, and just because I feel like talking to you right now because I finally had it, doesn't mean you're ready for that. So can you tell me, do you have five minutes within the next couple days that I could talk with you, okay? Finally, you're sitting and you're meeting with them. State the problem situation in terms of its consequences for you. This is what's happening. This is how it impacts me. This is how I see it. How do you see it? Okay, just because we see it our way doesn't mean you have all the facts. I can't tell you how many times I've gone with an assumption and I've laid it out for somebody and they go, oh, well, here's the other side that you don't know about. And I'm like, thank God I didn't come in with guns blaring and blaming them because I would have felt really stupid. And oftentimes we just don't have the whole picture. Even though that image before with all that stuff coming out of our head, it's a lot of information, but we usually don't have the whole picture. In some instances, it might make sense to express your feelings, especially if the R part of the CPR, the relationship has impacted. Like, wow, you know, I used to really work with you great, and lately it just hasn't been happening, and I want to turn that around because I need to have a good working relationship with you. I say maybe because, you know, that might be more appropriate in your personal relationship, maybe not always in your workplace relationship. Five, and this is the part that really indicates you're not just in there to complain. What can we do differently? This is, here are some of my ideas. What are your ideas, okay? This is a problem that affects both of us. First of all, can we get some agreement that there's a problem? Secondly, if so, what are some of your ideas? Here are some of my ideas. How can we address this? And then state the consequences of gaining or not gaining the other person's cooperation. Hopefully the carrot almost always works better than the stick. You know, if we can get this working better, I think it's going to benefit both of us. When dealing with a difficult person, you always want to determine uh, what their behavior is and what they're trying to respond to and understand that everyone has three underlying needs. One is to be listened to. One is to be taken seriously, and three is to be understood. So if nothing else, if you just take the time to hear their perspective and try to understand it. I mean, the biggest difficulty that most of us have, particularly if somebody's asserting themselves with us and saying, I have a problem with you, is that we tend to get defensive. So before we jump into understanding, or before we jump into, well, let me tell you why I do what I did, or, or did what I did, um, it's helpful to ask a lot of questions. Well, give me more information. Let me make sure I understand exactly what your complaint is. That is really hard to do. I mean, I get couples all the time that come in, and it's the first thing I do is I sort of observe their interaction pattern, and um, it's, I mean, most couples have the same thing in common, and they're not listening. So, you know, I have them stop, give them a pad of paper, or that person one, talk for no more than five minutes because you just can't remember any more than five minutes and the other person can't say a word they have to write it down then feed back to them what they heard the person say most of the time they got it wrong so I make them keep doing it until the person says yes now you understand what I'm saying okay now it's your turn to respond try that sometime not easy it's a very artificial way of having a conversation but it will save you time in a long run Sometimes you don't have a whole lot of options. You've tried everything, and it just makes sense to terminate the relationship. Uh, you don't want to jump to that right away, but in many instances, especially if it's toxic, that's the way to go. I got five minutes. Wow. Okay. So let me see what in here. I'm going to pass over this. Let's deal with anger. Oh, two great quotes. There's always a way to be honest without being brutal. 
people always say, well, I'm brutally honest. I'm like, yeah, I bet you are. And it probably doesn't work for you very well. The reason others get defensive with us is not because we lack the right skills, but because we have the wrong motives. Change what you want, and you will change how you act. Let's talk a little bit about anger. I saw this one time, and I thought it made a lot of sense, but probably not something we should do on a routine basis. Oh, I don't know. Can the people out there see what the slides? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I should have asked that a long time ago. <laughs> so um, let's talk a little bit for with the time remaining about um, how to handle somebody else's anger, because that's hard for most of us. Let me ask you a question. Think of a really good customer service experience you had where you were angry and somebody handled that really well. Anything come to mind? Here's what you probably remember. Think of a customer service experience you had where you were angry and they did not handle it well. Anything come to mind? Th those we remember, right? But I'm always impressed with skilled people who know how to handle my anger or anybody's anger. Okay. A couple of things that they do. No, number one, at the point that they can break in, <laughs> which is hard with an angry person, they might say something along the lines of, they reflect back what they hear. Mr. Gary, I can hear that you're very frustrated. And I'm going to do everything I can to help you out. Tell me more about the situation. Whew, already I can feel myself going, okay. Somebody gets it. Because A, I got a human on the phone. And you know, most of the time, you know, especially if I'm not acting as nicely as I should be, they tend to get defensive. Okay? So let's talk about some ideas of how you might be able to handle somebody else's anger. How many of you deal with students on a regular basis? Yeah, not that our students ever get angry, but occasionally when they do. Listen carefully to the angry person. It helps to address the helplessness that an angry person feels. That's the underlying feeling in most cases. They feel trapped, they feel helpless, they feel like nobody's gonna get this. This is big administrative nightmare, like dealing with the Wizard of Oz, and I just frustrated, okay? I'm, um, uh, anyway, okay. As you listen, try to stay neutral. Try not to take it personally. Breathe while they're talking. Count to 10 before responding. Hook out too long or they'll think you're hung up on them. Don't try to calm them down or tell them that they aren't entitled to their anger. That's only going to piss them off more. What makes more sense is to say, I can see you're really angry. I can see you're really frustrated. If anger comes across as over-dramatized, irrational, or used repeatedly, ignore it as it is probably manipulative. I say ignore it. That's not always so easy. But there are definitely people who know how to use their anger in a manipulative kind of way. And if it's happening consistently, that's what you might say. I mean, sometimes it's the first time dealing with the person. You have no way of knowing. When, when you say ignore it, are you saying don't take it to heart? Um, don't let it try not to take it personally. Okay. Right. I wouldn't just say, you're not here, talk to the hand. I don't think that's a good idea. Your tongue's a wild animal. You need to chain it and tame it and train it. Uh, here's why silence is golden when you're under fire from another person. You never regret what you never say. You give yourself time to think it through so that you can give a calm and reasonable response and you keep things from escalating to an uncontrollable level. And the last thing I will say is that um, there's this uh, book called um, Getting to Yes, which uh, talks about um, the process of soft negotiation uh, and uh, they have this concept called bat BATNA which is your best alternative uh, alternative to a negotiated agreement. I mean their concept in the book is to they have four ways that people can try to negotiate an agreement in a fair kind of way based on data and other kinds of things uh, but sometimes that doesn't work and it really does make sense to go to a third party ombudsperson, counselor, trusted friend to help two people um, get past a negotiated uh, or an inability to negotiate. It's one o'clock, we're at the end. If you um, want to talk about anything specifically about your personal situation, my phone number is on there. If you prefer to speak with a female, Joan's phone number is on there as well. If you'd like a copy of the slides, and I probably have another 10 slides on here with similar kinds of information, but other kinds of skills. Um, simply email me, and um, uh, I don't know if my email's on here, but it's my last name, R-U-G-G-I-E-R-I, -E -I, at umd.edu. 
And I thank you for your time and your participation, and see you next time I'm here. Thank you. You're welcome. And who had the check? <laughs>